Thank you. 
Calvary, where Jesus left and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands and feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The ancient steel by heavy stone, Messiah still in all. Bless yesterday, Father, when I 
we went to the creation museum oh, seeing so much truth lord come out about your truth of creation lord where this world hides and doesn't want everybody to see father i, I pray that the kids saw that yesterday father and, and really touched their hearts lord and, and I pray for those here that have any doubt, Lord, that they seek that truth. Yes, Lord. Because it's there. Uh, I didn't have any doubts, Lord. I even knew that you were real and what you have done. Yes. But just to see it scientifically proven, <laughs> it was just a, even more assurance, Father, that your word is true. Yes. And we're just so thankful, Lord, for that word that you've given us, that guidance, Lord, that we have daily to, to be able to fall upon on that solid rock of what you provided for us of the Bible, Lord. We're just thankful, Father, and today we get to hear from Pastor Reuben what you've given him from your word. Yes. And we ask you, Lord, just bless, bless us abundantly through his, his teaching and his gift that you've given him, Father. We are just so thankful, Lord, and we ask you to continue to bless this day and this beautiful sunny day that you've given us, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. 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 That's how great one is. Before we uh, get into the bulletin, I just I just want to say something that the Lord just kind of laid on my heart while we were worshiping, worshiping Him. Isn't He good? Yeah. You know, we we live in a world that we've been we've been studying about the the sexual immorality that's in our world today, and we live in this world that's just so corrupt. And it's it's been very subtle for years, and the church is affected by it. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about this building with everyone in it. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Amen. Whoever you are. And so there's a lot of challenges out there for us. A lot of temptation. A lot of loneliness. Struggles. We all struggle. We all mess up probably during the week. You probably all messed up this week. Probably pretty bad. But I want to remind you. That Jesus loves you. Amen. Thank you. He loves you. Yes. He, that's why he sent his son to take care of all those things that we fall into, that we struggle with. And so just be reminded, because you can come to church and you're like, I don't deserve to be here. Of course you don't. <laughs> None of us do. But we're here because Jesus, Thank you. his blood has allowed us to. It's his righteousness. His righteousness that allows us to stand before Him yes. complete. So, so don't don't get down on yourself. God has forgiven you. Realize that, but also at the same point, you know, we don't want to say, "Well, then I'm okay," and continue to live that way. No, 
let's let's live holy before Him. Amen. Let's, let's challenge ourselves. Yeah. But when we can't, you know, we can fall back on on Scripture. You know, that if we just confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Right? Yes. First John one nine. So I just the Lord just really put that on my heart. And maybe there's some that are hurting and feel like I shouldn't even be in church. Well, the reality is, is that you're here and God loves you cares about you and you're in the right place and just keep doing it and God will eventually have victory so if you have a bulletin open it up if you don't raise your hands and they'll get you a bulletin there and we'll go over a few items that are hopefully taking place here in the church Randy and I are kind of excited about this this uh, Jesus VR that we see in the middle column there what is Jesus VR that's virtual reality <laughs> so we were we were at our we were at a pastors conference and there was a table there that that had equipment for virtual reality. So we put on these these head of gear, sat on a chair, and our feet kind of dangled, or we could put it up on on the little first step there. And they should start showing uh, this movie about Jesus. And you're there, it's just virtual reality, you're there, and you're watching Jesus interacting with the disciples and other people. And you can look to the side, and you see people standing there, and you look to the other side, people, it's 360 degrees. Oh it's like you're there. And all of a sudden I felt like something was over here. All of a sudden I look, and there's this cow right in, right in <laughs> back of me, you know? And I thought, this is so awesome. And then they showed uh, Jesus and Satan at the pinnacle, and Satan's saying, cast yourself down. And when he said that, you know, I'm focused on them, thinking, wow, they're on this high high tower building, you know, and they're talking all of a sudden, cast yourself down. When he said that, I looked down, I'm like, whoa! And, and I was floating in the air, and I could see way, way, and so I grabbed hold of the post. It was really, really a weird sensation. So it's an hour-long movie, and we're hoping to bring it here. Yay. There is a cost of $15 per person, and they can service up to a hundred people. Uh, I know we don't have a hundred people, but in, unless you all decide to come, that would be awesome. But we're hoping to get at least fifty people to come. So we have a sign-up sheet out in the foyer area, and if you would like to see that movie, it will blow you away. And it is a, it is the story of Jesus, by the way. It's not just a movie, and it will really make it come alive to you as though you're right there. So. Please sign up if we can get, and the minimum is 50 people. If we can get 50 people, then um, we'll be able to do it here in the church. And you just sit in the chairs, they'll put on the equipment, and they just start showing the movies. And it's a one hour, one hour? I think it's a one hour show. So, well, we have to see if we get 50 people. So as soon as we know we have 50 people, then we'll, we'll set a date. Come on, sign up. So sign up, and, and we'll, we'll get that moving along here in August, I hope. It's, it's probably in August. All right, hopefully you're continuing to pray for those three people in your lives that, that God has put on your heart, that they would uh, come to know Jesus Christ, give you an opportunity to share with them. So keep praying, and let's just uh, see what the Lord does. Has anybody, just real quick, has anybody uh, uh, seen already something happen? Just kind of raise your hand that the Lord's already ministering at all. Okay, well, keep praying. It will. The Lord is faithful. Discipleship meeting will be August 6th, 6.30 here at the church. If I can have the ushers come forward. Uh, today, as you know, the youth have been serving uh, here at the church. They came early this morning, set everything up, and they're not going to collect tithes and offering for us. So bless them today. This is their day. Uh, they prepared lunch for us. I believe the, the meal is a hamburger, chips, and so forth for seven. Hot dogs. Hot dogs? Oh, hot dogs. Costco hot dogs. That's right. For seven dollars, oh six dollars, it just got lower, so that's even better. So support that ministry. They just got back from the Creation Museum, and I'm probably uh, sure that they were really surprised at what they saw, and probably strengthened their faith even more. Because when you're confronted with truth like that, you just go, "Wow, how come nobody's told us this?" Because you know, the world doesn't want you to hear it. So, so encourage them. These are our future for the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that, that we all get, Lord, to support your work here, Father. You have been so faithful, Lord, to us, even when we didn't deserve it. Uh, the scripture says in Romans 5, 8, that even while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes. 
And Lord, even while we are still sinners as believers, you continue to pray for us daily and forgive us of all our sins. Thank you, Lord. And so, Lord, you're so deserving. And so, Lord, this is our way of saying we love you. We want to support your work. We want others to come to know Jesus, and they are in this ministry, Lord. And we're just hoping, Lord, that you would begin to have a revival here in our church, Lord. And touch the hearts of your people, Lord. It's, it's time to let go of the past and start looking to the future and what you would have for us to do, Lord. So bless the tithe and offerings, Lord. Use it for your glory, Lord. And then, Lord, as we get into your word, I pray you challenge us, you strengthen us, Lord. You correct us if you need be, Lord. But, Lord, most of all, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we would have the power to live out our life as believers in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's open up our Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and they will bring you one. I always feel it's important for you to see the words on paper so that you will be encouraged along with us. We will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we will be looking at verses 2 through 6. And this morning's theme is Biblical Relationships, part 2. I encourage you to view part 1 if you missed it or would like to review. Uh, just go to the Facebook. If you're my friend, you can just look it up there, or if not, friend me, and, and I will uh, friend you accept your friendship, and then you can look at it. And I encourage those of you that are on Facebook right now, those of you that are listening, to do a, uh, what is it again? Party? Watch party. Watch party right now. And just start a watch party right now, and others will join you and watching you. Uh, last week when we did our first part of this theme, Biblical Relationship, it was really used by the Lord in a great way. So I really feel that um, the Lord is touching a point here in our culture that is so important for the body of Christ and for the world. Uh, I found it interesting that just not myself, but other churches are actually teaching on marriage and relationships right now within Southern California. Several other churches that I know of pastors are, are doing a series on that. So I find that interesting because when something like that happens, it's not because we call each other up and say, let's do a series on... You know, it's because the Spirit is moving. Amen. And for some reason, the Spirit wants the body of Christ, not just mm -hmm. us, but the whole body of Christ, to understand what's going on in the world today. And we're challenged by this sexual immorality that's in our world. It's in the church. It's in the church. Now, how, how can I say something like that uh, and it be true? Because it was true of the time of Paul. He's dealing with the Corinthian church, which was a very carnal church. And they were involved in some of these issues that we are dealing with today. And so if it's true, uh, true back then, then it's true also today that it can happen. And the church is dealing with these sins. In fact, I would probably venture to say, and, and statistics show it very clearly, that probably over 50% of the church is dealing with some sort of sexual sin. That's right. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it's a, it's a sin like leprosy. You really don't see it. It slowly eats away at you in your relationship with Christ Jesus. And so you need to really hang on to the Lord. You need to understand what it is that you're doing, what you're involved in, and, and then take every step, every measure possible to deliver yourself from these things. God loves you. He cares about you. And that's not even a question. It should not be a question because he loved the Corinthian church. And Paul is writing on these issues because God loved the church and wanted them to understand of proper marriage and relationships and how sexual uh, relationships work, that intimacy together. And so we're going to talk a little bit, which is strange. I struggled over this message, especially these verses. And these verses are dealing with marriage specifically. Last week, we, we talked a little bit about um, men touching women, kindling that fire. And that, that kind of spans any relationship, whether you're single, married, whether you're a widow, um, any man should be very careful on how they touch a woman. And I'm not talking about touching, but kindling some sort of sexual relationship. And now he's more focused on the relationship between a man and a woman that are married. And so we're going to look at that 
this morning. And I struggled with it because it, there's some very explicit, very clear directions here. And I think that the church doesn't talk about it that much. I know there was uh, a couple of years ago, there were some churches that started getting into this topical study on our sexual uh, desires for one another as husband and wives. And they were getting into details. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I totally disagree with, with that. I don't think that's appropriate for church. But I think we need to at least uh, throw out uh, what Paul is saying here and then let the Holy Spirit minister to you uh, as you deal with your relationship. So marriage brings a great responsibility. It really does. And there is an intimacy within that responsibility that every one of us says we are married are accountable to God for. And if you're not married, this message is for you too. Because one day you will be married. I remember, I remember a, a friend of mine years ago, a pastor said, we're going to start a, a series on marriage. And he stood up and walked out. And, and later I said, why did you walk out? He goes, well, that's not for me. I'm single. And I says, one day you'll be married. Oh, no, I'm never getting married. A few years later, he got married. So, so this message is good. And if it's not good for you at this point, you might be able to take it and minister to someone else. So don't just think of yourself. Think about others, too, and how they can be ministered by it. Mm -hmm. And so there is this great responsibility. And in the world of confusion over proper marriage relationships, we need some clear instructions from God, don't we? Because yes. yes. the world is confused over it. It's just really strange how open they are to all kinds of suggestions. The proper marriage will always meet the needs of that couple. There is a need of conversation within marriage, right? We need to communicate. We, we need to converse with one another about daily issues in life and spiritual things and even about our sexuality. And there's a need for financial security in marriage. We all need to feel that security that, that God has taken care of us, that God has provided, that my husband is working. Uh, and maybe if the spouse is working too and providing for the household, that is also a part of marriage, a very important part of marriage. And there's that leaving of the home and joining with another and becoming one that's a part of that marriage need and also the social acceptance uh, that is bound up within the marriage community. There is a social acceptance to it and there's a battle right now against it, right? As you know, right. whether marriage is really something that should be sanctified, that is holy, that is only the only way that you can have a relationship. And the battle is from the world trying to say, no, it's not the only thing. And that... That diminishes marriage, doesn't it? It's yeah. saying that that's not the only way. That is not the critical way. That is not what should be sanctified. There's other ways of marrying, whether it's male against with male or female with you know female. Or you're gonna you're gonna see it down the road, whether it's three people, and they're already doing that and talking about uh, three sons getting married, whether two males and a female or two females and a male, and they should also have the same opportunity because they're all in love with each other and so forth. And you're going to see it get like this, just like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. The need for family, definitely a need for family. The world needs to see what a unit is in the family, a husband, a wife, and the children, and how it functions together. And also the need for companionship. But I think the most important and the one that we're challenged with today is the need for affection and sexual intimacy. There's a struggle there within the church itself, I believe. How do we as married couples approach that intimacy from a biblical perspective? And Paul will give us instruction on how to have a mutual sexual relationship here. We live in a world where we are surrounded by sexual images and fantasies, and we think that those things are appropriate for our marriages when the reality is it is not appropriate. We need a biblical view and not a world view. We need to know what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation. You need to read the book of uh, the Songs of Solomon. You know, that book is filled with relationships and how we are to be intimate with our spouses. In fact, the Jewish people would not read the book of Solomon until they were the age of uh, 30 or older because they felt it was too explicit and too detailed for a relationship for someone younger. But it's there for us. The Lord put it in the scriptures for us to grab hold and, and learn and have a biblical relationship. And then you come across these few verses here, actually all of seven. And it basically started back in what? 
chapter 5 when he talks about fornication and so forth with, with uh, uh, couples or with, with singles and so forth. And he's dealing with this because that's what the Corinthian church were dealing with. And, and here he's talking about the marriage, about verse 1, do not touch a woman. Don't even kindle the fire. Don't even go down that route. So as a man, as a single man, you need to be careful that you're not starting something that shouldn't be started. You need to allow the Lord uh, to bring you your spouse through much prayer, through fasting, through attending church and fellowship and finding someone like-minded and, and, and then going in that right direction. And then verses 2 through 6, we have the principle of mutual sexual responsibility within the marriage. Three points uh, this morning. First point is affection for your spouse. Affection for your spouse. Authority over your spouse. What does that mean, having authority over your spouse? Abstinence from your spouse. So we're going to touch on those three points that Paul talks about here. So let's read the text so that we get the context. We'll go ahead and, and throw in verse 1 just so we can kind of remember a little bit of what we said last week. And then we'll read down to verse 6 to just get the context here. It says in verse 1, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman or to start the fire, as I said. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. Verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprave one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. Now we'll touch on these and I'm going to give you the Greek so that you can get the tenses behind the message here and the definitions of the words of what exactly Paul is saying. Because as I read some commentaries, uh, some of them uh, weren't really saying what was really written in the scriptures. And I think it's probably because it was written at a time where it's taboo to talk about those things, you know, in the culture. And we don't want to be very clear or explicit and so forth. But the Bible's the Bible. God has given it to us. Yes. And we should talk about the things that are in it so that it will help us in our life. And I think that that's why we struggle so much. I think marriages struggle because of these issues that we deal with. There's an expectation that it shouldn't be there. And you might be expecting uh, some very high standards by, for your spouse and they shouldn't be there. Uh, you should be like Christ that loved the church and the church that loved Christ. So instead of a man touching a woman outside of marriage, a husband must render to his wife the affection due her. And Paul is headed in that direction. Look, if you're married, don't touch a woman. What you need to be touching is your wife. That's why God gave you a wife. Amen. That's why you're yeah. married. That's why you came together to become one. You were separate, but now you're one. Your thoughts and focus should be on her and not on anything else that is out there. So he says in verse 2, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. So last week, we looked at verse 1, and let me give you the Greek so you remember. Moreover, verse 1 starts, Moreover concerning, or because of the things about which, or that you personally wrote on, specifics. So they had written Paul some specific questions, very specific. And so he's answering those questions specifically. So everything that he is saying here is an answer to their questions. We don't have the questions. We don't have the questions. He doesn't give us the questions, but he gives us the answers here. And he says it is good or admirable for a man not to, not at all, touch or kindle the fire. In other words, don't fasten yourself to another woman. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're a widow, or, or so forth. Only if you're married. And that's where he comes in verse 2. It says, because, but because of all kinds of immorality. That's how the Greek reads there. All kinds of immorality. So it's not just one type of immorality. This is talking about the illicit sex. It's talking about adultery. It's talking about fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, 
bestiality. This is what was going on at that time. And also adultery with divorced uh, people and couples and so forth. So he's saying because of all this confusion that's out in the culture there in the Corinthians that you had wrote me about, because of all of this stuff, I'm going to write to you the answer. So Paul is beginning with, with here is the people are to be married. That that is the most important thing, is that you should be married. If you're going to have a relationship, an intimate relationship, then you need to go and get married. Let me say that one more time for you younger ones. If you're going to have a relationship with your girlfriend, you need to be married before you have that relationship. Very clear, that's what he's saying. And I think pastors, parents, brothers and sisters are to instruct the church members to go and get married. To go and get married. Don't be tempted by sexual desires that are outside of marriage. It's an immorality and a behavior that will lead to destruction in your relationship with Christ. Now, in light of the danger of sexual immorality, which is ever present in the Corinthian culture and also in our own, it's a, it is inappropriate or appropriate for a husband and wife to have sexual relationships. And so Paul is not saying sex is the only reason for marriage here, but marriage is the most important thing. So he's simply answering a specific question about marriage, not trying to give a complete theological study on marriage. So he starts with this affection that a husband is to have for his spouse and a spouse, a woman, for her husband. Affection also reminds us that when a couple is unable for whatever physical or other reasons to have a complete sexual relationship, they can still have an affectionate relationship and thus fulfill God's purpose for this command. And that's important for me to say because it's not all about that intimacy. There's more to, to our relationships than intimacy. There is affection that goes along with it. Paul strongly puts forth the idea that there is a mutual sexual responsibility in marriage. The husband has obligations towards the wife, and the wife has obligations towards the husband. In the next statement, he says in the Greek, each man is to continually have, continually, his own wife. Now, the emphasis is on the second continually. So, in other words, what Paul is saying here, a husband or a man is to only have his wife continually to be joined to her, to be bound to her, and to no one else. And continually <clears throat> suggests forever, until they die and go home to be with the Lord. Now, this is true throughout the scriptures. God hasn't changed his mind. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Proverbs 5.18 says this. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. This is Solomon talking about a marriage. And it's the same truth back then as it is today. Paul later to the Ephesians will write, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Very clear commandments there for us. Very clear commandments. You, you want a good relationship? Then husbands, you ought to love your wives. Well, how do I do that? Well, how did Christ love the church? He gave himself for the church. So learn to sacrifice. And that means even when you're right, sacrifice that. Zip it up. You don't have to be right. It's okay. I'm finding that the older I get, that there are things that just really don't matter. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> the women are like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that is right. Just don't matter. How about if we do that? Sounds good to me. Doesn't matter. I would have fought before. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But I want to do it. But I don't want to. And it turns into an argument. Well, I won't talk to you for a week. <laughs> Until I get my way, you know. Instead of just saying, you know what, it's okay, that's fine, because it really doesn't matter. It's not going to change our relationship. It's not going to change the world, you know, so it changes the decor in the, in the house. Who cares? <laughs> Everyone has different tastes and decor, you know, and so forth. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. I, I noticed that, that when I'm struggling as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a pastor, 
you know, as a brother in Christ, when, I, when I'm struggling, I don't hear a lot from Christ. You know, he, don't, he doesn't condemn me. He doesn't say you're wrong. He doesn't say this or that. You know, he's just quietly, patiently waiting for me to learn. And sometimes I think that we need to be very patient and quiet at times and allow the Lord's Spirit to minister to our spouses. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Respect your husbands. God, ladies, this is, this is so simple because a, a, a man is, is prideful. You know, men are different than women, and I hope you realize that already. <laughs> They're so different. And, and I know you don't understand it. In fact, you think it's stupid, you know, that they have to behave that way. But they're very prideful. They're very arrogant. And if you disrespect them, man, they just, they just can't take it. Just don't disrespect us. But respect us. And boy, you have our hearts. You know, if you can respect us in, in every aspect, uh, then you've got us right by your side. But as soon as they feel disrespected or belittled, as though we're stupid and don't know anything, then it, right away it's like, man, that really hurts us a lot. If you just learn to respect your husband, you know, and, and I don't know how that looks from your perspective. It may look silly, but, you know, just encourage them. You're the man. You're the head of the home. You're the warrior. You're the fighter. You're the one who will get it done. You know, if there's a struggle, if I, I know you'll do it, honey. I know you'll do it. You'll figure it out. Like, yeah, I know I will. Oh, God, I'm do it. And you're like, oh, man, this is kind of silly. I got to do this. But you know what? It helps. And it works, and it works. You know, they're finding that, um, I was sharing with the guys yesterday, I was watching a video on bullying, and they're finding that uh, if you confront a bully, that bully's just going to get more angry, and you're going to get more confrontation. So if, if the bully comes up to you and says, you're ugly, and you're going to go, well, you're ugly too. Well, you're uglier than, than your mama, you know? And, and then you're going to go, well, you're uglier than your daddy, you know, that whole thing. I remember as a little kid saying, well, your, your mom's lower than the curb, you know, and just all that. And, and bullying begets bullying, and you go back and forth. But they're finding that if you confront it with love and kindness, which is interesting, and re respect, it changes the whole attitude of a bully. The bully comes and says, you're ugly, and you go, thank you, I, I know I'm ugly. So, where, do you, where do you go from there? <laughs> you don't go anywhere, right? Or you tell them, well, you're pretty strong. It looks like you're strong and you're good looking. Oh, well, not, not that way, but you know. You're, and it immediately diffuses them because you don't give them a, a way to shoot back at you. And I think that we have to learn those things because sometimes we want to just fight back. And the reality is it's okay, let it go. Don't fight. That's fine, honey. You're the man. You can get it done. Yeah, okay, I can do it. And I think that respect is needed there within the relationship. So we see Paul talking about, and then also Malachi, when he's talking about hating divorce and so forth, this is what he says in Malachi 2.13. This is the second thing you do. This is the Lord speaking to the children of Israel, the priesthood and so forth. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Now, that, that's the situation. They're coming to God like, this is happening, and that's happening. We're struggling here. And they're crying before the Lord, and they're bringing offerings because they want Him to do something. And the Lord's saying, but I'm withholding my hand. They're going, what for? What's going on? And He says, because the Lord has been witness between you and your wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So be careful that you deal with your wife correctly in love and wives respect your husbands. So each man is to continually have, continually. The statement here reflects a Greek idiom, which means let them have sexual relationships. That's what he's saying here. Because of what's going on there in the world with the immorality of all kinds, what you need to do as a church and a husband and his wife is you two need to fulfill one another sexually. Mm -hmm. Jewish people saw marriage, uh, sexual intimacy as the best deterrent to sexual immorality. And Paul here is agreeing with the Jewish culture of that time. And he says it the same to the woman. That, and each woman is to continually have continually her own husband. So it's a mutual thing. It's not just one, but mutually agreeing that you're enough for me and I'm enough for you in that relationship. 
In verse 3, he goes on. It says, let the husband render to her, to his wife, the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Now let me read this in the Greek. The husband must continually fulfill or deliver continually. The emphasis is on continually again. You have to do this. You have to deliver or fulfill his husbandly duties to his wife. There's a requirement there. You are to fulfill her continually so that she's not looking around anywhere else, which we know happens with the wife or a husband. So Paul's view here of intimacy as a mutual obligation. The meaning of marital duty here or conjugal rights. Each of us has conjugal rights as, as a married couple. A husband and the wife. Greek writers sometimes portrayed submitting to sexual relationships or passions as bringing oneself under someone else's control. They felt like, well, if I submit to you, then you are now controlling me. And they didn't like that. They didn't like that at all. Others in, in the Greek culture were thinking that if we just abstain from sexual desires, which uh, sometimes the church thinks this, you know, well, if we just don't have sexual desires for our wives or anyone else, that we must be holier than thou. You know, and then we somehow are drawing closer to God because we're not doing those intimate things uh, and we're drawing closer to God and thus his blessings will come upon us. And Paul's saying that either one of those are true. You have to have that balance. The affection do her is an important phrase. Since Paul meant this to apply to every Christian marriage, it shows that every wife has affections do her. There's a need there that God has put within women that they would have a need for affection, for intimacy. And it's not about the sexual act. It is about the intimacy that goes along with that. Now, Paul doesn't think that only the young and pretty or submissive wife is do this. <laughs> Every wife is do this intimacy because she is the wife of a Christian man. So Paul also emphasizes what the woman's needs not merely sexual relationship, but the affection that comes along with that, which is so important. And if a husband is having sexual relationships with his wife, but without true affection to her, he is not giving his wife what she is due. In other words, if he's just thinking of himself, then he's not doing his job. Because it's not about himself, it is about his wife. The emphasis is on, go, or on giving on I owe you instead of you owe me. And doesn't that kind of follow along what Paul says to the Philippians? Think more highly of others than you think of yourselves. Amen. And that principle applies even in our relationships with one another, in our intimate relationships, that we are to think about the other more highly than we think of ourselves. Now, in God's heart, sex is put on a much higher level than merely being the husband's privilege and the wife's duty. She is to respond to him, and he is to tell her that he loves her. He's the knight in shining armor. He's the prince. He's the Casanova. He's the one that brings the flowers home. He's the one that encourages her with beautiful words, you know, and so forth, you know. Even in the most comfortable clothes that he could come along and say, hey, you look sexy. And she's like, what? <laughs> I'm not even wearing anything. He's like, wow, that made me feel good. I think that's what she would say. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. Right? Now, it doesn't stop there, though, because Paul says, likewise also the wife to the husband. And that's how it says it in the Greek. <laughs> and, the, and the wife, you need to do the same for the husband. So the affection is vital for the, part, for the parts of marriage, especially in the sexual relationship. So important to encourage one another. If you are a person that's always saying negative things and bringing about negative vibes into those relationships, you're going to get that. You're going to get that. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap, even in those relationships. So try changing that. I know it's hard and it's difficult. Here's the application. But you have to change your mindset because this is the person that God has given to you, has entrusted to you to be your husband or your wife, and now you are to live together until the day that death does us part. And so do the best that you can to encourage and strengthen one another. Now, at first you might think, but I'm, I feel like I'm not telling the truth. I know I, I, I feel like that at some times. You know, you put a smile on your face, but inside you're going, I'm not very happy. <clears throat> 
Isn't that hypocrisy? It is. But here's the thing. You know it, and you confess that, and you say, Lord, make that smile align with my heart. And in time, what happens is your smile aligns with your heart. All of a sudden, you're smiling, and now it's really coming from your heart because you've changed your whole mindset. You have to start that way. It might feel weird. It might feel like you're not being sincere, but eventually your heart falls along. It sounds strange to think of it that way, and you think maybe God needs to just somehow, he is, but you have to take those steps of faith and allow him to do that, to allow him to do that. It's work. It is work, definitely, and it's not easy at all. Second point, authority over your spouse. Who has authority over your spouse, right? They both think they have authority. <laughs> I have authority over my own body. Isn't that what the world tells us? Mm -hmm. Women have authority over their own body. Nobody can tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, you never hear men have authority over their own body, mm -hmm. but it's always women having authority over their own body. Well, that's a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. The authority that we have is over one another. <clears throat> so let's look at verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and the and likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. A man would run to the temple at that time to Aphrodite, and he would look for a prostitute. Love and sex are to take place in the home, is what Paul would say. Instead of you running towards that, you need to run home, and you need to have a relationship with your wife, is what Paul is saying here. And you have authority, and she has authority over your body. Now, Paul further explains this responsibility. In the Greek, it says this of verse 4. The wife does not have authority to hold her own body continually, but the husband does. So the continually, which is emphasized here, means that she doesn't have authority over her body. Now, here's the challenge, ladies, because you're thinking, boy, if I'm not in the mood, forget you. <laughs> right? That's not what Paul's saying. That's not what Paul's saying at all. Think more highly of others than you think of yourself. Yeah, that's hard. I know. I get it. And these obligations are so concrete, though, in the Greek. It would, or it could be said that your wife's body does not even belong to herself, but to her husband. Wow. That doesn't sit right with me. Wait a minute. I'm a human being. I have rights. Didn't we fight for these rights? Back then, I mean, women have been oppressed for a long time, all the way back in Christ. And you saw how last week Jesus had liberated, liberated women compared to the world. It wasn't until the 1950s that women could even vote, right? How about owning a house? A woman could not even cite a deed to own a house uh, uh, until the early 1900s. Usually they had to get a cosigner, their husband or their father. And yet Jesus has liberated them. And now you're telling me that my body is not my own, but it's my husband and he owns it? I'm not telling you that, by the way. The Bible is telling you that. <clears throat> it's what Jesus said. The same principle is true of the husband's body in regards to his wife. So God is telling both of us that. That, that is exactly what he is saying here. This does not justify the husband abusing or bullying his wife sexually or otherwise, by the way. It's not saying that you put them in some situation that's going to hurt them or harm them or belittle them. It has to be one of affection and love and intimacy and grace and mercy. You have to add all of those things there together. You will not hurt them or harm them because you love them. And I have to make that very clear. And if you're in an abusive situation, you get out of it. That person does not want you in that relationship. And they're proving it by the way they're treating you. Whether it's verbally or whether it's physically. Because a husband or a wife that truly loves their spouse will not verbally or physically harm the other person. Mm -hmm. Though they have right of that body, they will not harm it. That's right. The Lord says, if you give me the desires... You get, you'll, the Lord said that I will give you the desires of your heart. See, when your heart is right with the Lord, then your desires are right with the Lord. Amen. You'll have His desires. That's right. And so if you have desires for your spouse, then those desires will be right desires. You will want to totally fulfill them and love them and complete them and not harm them. So in, I, I need to say that because it sounds so male chauvinist, but I also said that it's true of women having authority over their husband's body, too. So Paul seems to know a little bit here about marriage, doesn't he? Like, where is this all coming from, Paul? 
He must have been married. I think it's, it, it's more evidence that Paul had a good wife. And this wife allowed him to do what he did for the gospel's sake. So Paul adds to this. He says, likewise also the husband does not have authority to withhold his own body continually over the wife's. And by the way, the context seems to show that it's in our intimacy, not in, not in anything else than that. So you can't go around and say, your body's mine, so I want you to go and run 10 miles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your intimacy, your affection for one another. So many great men in the scriptures have known and loved great women. And I think when this functions correctly, God, what God can do, what God can do. We see the love between Adam and Eve. What a, a great responsibility they had. Jacob and Rachel, Rachel, Boaz and Ruth, David and Abigail. Abigail was such an encouragement to David, and yet Abigail was a second wife or so that came about through some situations that was not normal, and yet she totally supported David completely. Interesting story. I read this about John Wesley. He came to America not as a saved man. You know, John Wesley was the one that started the, the uh, Methodist church. But there's an interesting story here, and I read this, and I thought, wow. And I don't know why I'm sharing this, but I think that uh, it's just evident that, that if you put your marriage in a proper perspective, you can do great works. But he wrote this. He deals, I came to this country to convert Indians, but who is going to convert John Wesley? He realized that uh, he wasn't even a Christian when he came. It was more of a mandate by the religious system there from England to go to America and convert Indians to their religious system. The story goes that the crown had sent to America a characterless nobleman. And due to the terrible customs of the day, the nobility was entitled to marry the finest. And he had married a woman of striking beauty and strong personality who also was an outstanding Christian. Then there came into John Wesley's colony a fiery young missionary. And these two fell in love. Ooh, interesting. I thought that was interesting. That, that John Wesley was married. He was in a religious system. He comes to America to evangelize. And then he's here and he finds this young woman that's a missionary, that's a real missionary, a real Christian. And they fall in love. Does that happen? Well, it did. Does it happen today? Yes, it does. It happens today, and we see it even in the church. People getting divorced, and then they end up marrying someone else and doing a work for the Lord. It's strange. It's awful. It shouldn't happen, but God works all things out for good for some reason. It's not recommended, and nor do I approve of it, but I'm just reading history here is what has happened. And this is what happened. But she said, no, John, God has called you to go back to England and do some great service for him. It was she who sent John Wesley back to England to marry the Methodist Church. Back to England, Wesley was converted, and she was his inspiration. Behind every great man, there seems to be a great woman. Amen. This woman was a Christian, and she realized that their love was inappropriate. She said, God had a greater work for you. Now, that's authority over a body, and allowing him to go back and do the work that he did through the Methodist Church. And God used the Methodist Church in a great way. <clears throat> now, so, a husband has authority over his wife's body when it comes to intimacy, and a wife has authority over the husband's body in a proper context. Please understand that. Third point, abstinence from your spouse. Now, some were saying there in the church that abstinence from intimacy with your wife could lead to a more holy life. And so they were taking these abstinent opportunities for too long and it was causing problems. So he says in verse 5, do not deprive one another except for with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So Paul gives us this quick easy instructions here that if you are going to abstain from each other, it better be for religious purposes. You better be praying. You better be fasting. You better be seeking God. If not, Satan will come in and then tempt you. And then because of your lack of control, you'll fall into sin. 
Joel chapter 2 said this in the Old Testament. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, the nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. It was to consecrate, to set apart your life for the Lord, making him first. And that's what they were doing in the Corinthian church, trying to get closer to God, but it was going too far. Matthew 4.10 Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So there is an importance for us to abstain as we seek the Lord and to worship the Lord and draw closer to the Lord so that everything else falls into place. You know, for seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and then everything else will be added unto you. So he gives us this insightful instruction. Let me read it to you in the Greek. Stop continually depriving or robbing continually one another. And they were literally robbing one another because they would abstain from each other. Jewish teachers who were trying to formulate laws in this period differ on how long a man could vow to abstain from intimacy with his wife. Some said a week, some said two weeks. Paul doesn't give a timetable here. He lets the couple decide on how long, is, how long it should be before they should come back together. But he said, except by agreement and in harmony for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer as you do daily. Though they were daily praying, this was something that they wanted to do, that was extra curriculum. They wanted to draw closer and they wanted to pray more and devote themselves to fasting and praying. But they needed to do this continually. And then he said, come together again. And this again is the, the conjugal uh, cohabitation, that intimacy. And I want you to come together again. Why? So that Satan, your adversary, will not continually tempt you as he has because of your lack of self-control. In other words, Satan is there and he will tempt you because he continually tempts you. He doesn't stop. It is a attack that is ongoing continually. So we have to be aware of this, that everything we are doing in this world, in our relationships, there's always going to be an encounter with Satan. There's always going to be attacks. And we have to understand that. And so we must come together and bind with one another. And back and come when they deprive one another as the door or an open door is given to the tempter. Deprivation gives occasion to the depraved to look elsewhere for fulfillment. Now, it might be easy to think that self-control is expressed by abstaining from sexual relationships and marriage, but Paul says that to deprave one another is to show a lack of self-control and a lack of self-control that will leave one easy to be tempted by Satan. So you might think you have that control, but the fact is you probably don't, and you're leaving room for the devil. So Paul gives us these instructions for our relationships. We must adhere to these to have a beautiful marriage that reflects Christ and the church. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 6, I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. So he ends with this statement. In the Greek it says, But this I say to point out continually by way of concession or indulgence, not of a commandment. He's saying this not as a commandment, but it is a guideline. To follow, so that Satan will not have an opportunity to tempt neither the member of the marriage relationships, either one of them. He's saying this so that they both understand that the enemy's there to disrupt their relationship and cause the relationship to be severed by sexual immorality. Let me close with this. Three, three points are important. But I think more important than these three points is our relationship with Jesus Christ. No. Do you know that we are legally married to Jesus? Mm -hmm. We're Amen. legally married to Jesus. Yes. Revelation twenty two seventeen says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. The bride and the groom are going to suffer there in heaven when we finally meet him in the air. We're legally married to Christ. And that's why there's no marriage in heaven. Neither will there be given marriage in heaven. Right. We will no longer be married to our spouse. We'll all be married to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealous, for I betroth you to one husband, Paul said, so that it, to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin.
Paul was saying, look, I, God is jealous of you. He loves you so much. He is the groom. You're the bride. And when you have illicit sex with idolatry, anything other than Christ, you're committing that adultery on Jesus Christ. The marriage is to reflect Christ and the church. And what we do as married couples reflects on Christ and how he treats the church. And the world needs to see a proper reflection of Christ and the church and how it functions. And when we are out there as believers into idolatry, into worldly things, <laughs> it lets the world know that we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Back then, a Jewish marriage custom and traditions looked nothing like modern weddings today. And you know how our modern weddings uh, today look. There's a basic format to it, and it changes depending on, on the person and the religious <clears throat> beliefs that they might have. But back then, <clears throat> they remained a vivid testimony of God's love for all of us. In the days of Jesus Christ, a marriage was arranged by the father of both the groom and the bride. Essentially, the bride was considered the property of her father until such time as the father representing a different family established a contract with her father to give her husband away or daughter away. So this was a contractual thing. Before they even were were married, he, at times when they were youth, they agreed that these two would be married. The modern custom of daddy giving away his daughter at the formal wedding originated from these ancient practices. That's why a father gives the daughter away in our marriage. It means that it means the deal is sealed and it's final. So when your dad says, here she is, that's it. She's no longer mine. She is now your responsibility. You need to take care of her. After the formal betrothal, the bride would remain in her father's home and the groom would return to his own father's house in order to prepare for the new bride. After a period of time, the groom would return from his father's house, consummate the marriage, and emerge from the marriage chambers to announce to the village that the couple are now fully married. This was a feast that lasted seven days, by the way. This was a great wedding. And this all was traditional, and it all happened because it was all speaking of something greater than them. Following the marriage feast and the celebration of the new family, the groom would then take his bride back to his father's house, where he would remain as her husband, and the two would raise a family there. And in John 14, we see this picture so clearly. Jesus speaks prophetically about his departure in death. He comes to the earth. He creates the church, the bride, and then he leaves. He goes home. His words were spoken in the upper room on that night when he was betrayed. Alluring to the well-known marriage custom of that day, Jesus told his disciples he would be leaving for a time and returning to his father's house, a place where there were many mansions. Now he's there now, but he's going to come back. He was leaving to prepare a place for them so that he could come back, take them to his father's house where they would live for eternity. And this is a picture of Christ and the church. And this was a wedding ceremony that took place in the Jewish customs and it pointed to Jesus Christ. So we have a responsibility to reflect that marriage, Christ and the church. And nothing should get in the way of that marriage. We should be pure in all our approach to the Lord Jesus Christ and in every way. The bride's price was paid by Jesus Christ. Amen. He paid the dowry. How? On the cross. He left his gift there and gave us eternal life. It is through Jesus Christ that we have eternal life. It's through his work and through his blood that we have eternal life. And it's that relationship that we must maintain in our walk daily. Amen? Yeah. What a beautiful picture that Paul has given us here of our relationship with Christ. And that nothing immoral should come between us. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And I pray, Lord, that it would be your Holy Spirit, Father, would, would take these words... As we review them, maybe take this home and go back and read this again and, and get challenged by how we are representing Christ and the church Lord, in our own relationships, Lord. And Lord, maybe we can even, through the power of your Spirit, begin to implement some of these 
suggestions, Father, the application, Lord, of treating one another more respectfully and lovingly, Lord, in our relationships. Help us, Father, because it is difficult. We live in such a confused world, and, and we came out of that world not knowing anything different, Father. But now, Lord, we have the truth, and the truth has set us free, Father, from the bondage of this world and from the chaos that it produces because there is no... No biblical truth there, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But Lord, we have that biblical truth now. And I pray that we would apply it through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If this message touched you, and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you to come up afterwards. Randy will be up here, and he would love to lead you to the Lord and pray with you. If you just need prayer, come up here and get prayer. I believe Randy's wife will be up here, Bertha, also, and she will pray with you if you're a lady. So Carlos has a couple of things to say after the announcements. So after this song, uh, please uh, hear what he has to say about the youth, and then we'll see you out there. God bless you. Hey, everyone. Whoa. I didn't know it was that loud. Good, uh, good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Uh, I'm Carlos. Uh, most of you guys know, hopefully, uh, who I am. I'm the youth leader, and so we're rock solid youth ministries. And um, we just want to thank you guys for the continued blessings that you've been giving us. Uh, we were able to go to the Creation Museum at full pay for because of all the donations and the food that you guys were giving us. Oh, the food, no. Actually, hold on. The buying of the food. That's how we got the money to go to the Creation Museum. So they got food, they got lunch and dinner done, paid for and everything. So it was pretty cool that those were able to make it. Uh, we obviously got our shirts done too, which I know you guys are probably waiting for. We should have our shirts by next 